Hi, Hi Frank. Frank. Hey, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm all right. Good. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk. Sure. Um, I've been reading your book, America at the Crossroads. Uh, it's a great book. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. I've been uh, especially pleased to find that in the penultimate chapter, you use the phrase global governance in an approving tone of voice. As you know, <laughs> right. that's the surest way to win my approval. Right. Um, you're, 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 I think it's, it's probably safe to say you're not quite yet as thoroughgoing a one-worlder as I would like, but you're moving in the right direction, and I think it's just right. a matter of What's that? Just a matter of time. Matter, I, think, I think before long we'll have you not only singing Kumbaya, but singing it in Esperanto. <laughs> right. Um, the, uh, you know, the book is actually a lot richer uh, and forward-looking than I had anticipated, because the publicity surrounding the book has been about uh, your treatment of uh, history of neoconservatism, the legacy, your celebrated break with neoconservatism. Uh, there's actually a lot more to it than that. And uh, that's what I want to talk mainly about, is the stuff that's gotten less publicity. Um, I do want to start with, with a couple of quick questions about uh, the neoconservative issue. Okay. Um, and one of them is, is maybe a little personal, but I'm just wondering whether at kind of a social level your break with uh, with the other neocons has been a little uncomfortable. I mean, these were your, your friends, not just your ideological allies. And, of course, it's possible to disagree with people and continue to be friends. Um, but, you know, in some, certainly in the case of uh, Charles Krauthammer, I gather friendly is maybe not the way you would describe <laughs> your current relationship. I don't know. And ju yeah. just in general, um, what has it, has it been a little unpleasant at some level? Uh, Krauthammer is the only one that has really been just outright hostile. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what people are saying behind my back. Certainly, most of my friends continue to be friendly, and and actually, I've been pleased that some of the people who have written, um, you know, critical reviews, like Aaron Friedberg of Princeton or Gary Rosen, who's the uh, managing editor of Commentary, you know, the reviews have been critical, but they've still been respectful, and they've actually tried to engage on substance rather than just uh, name calling. Mm -hmm. So I would say that overall it's not been uh, not been that bad. Yeah. And I still, you know, I've gotten along with Bill Crystal just fine even though I've criticized him in the book as well. Mhm. Mm okay. Well, if it's any consolation, my history with Charles somewhat parallels yours in, in, <laughs> in a less dramatic and public way, but um yeah. The the uh, now, now there's another question about neoconservatism. Um I wanted to ask and and it's it's this, it's slightly complicated, but you know, this book is being hailed as your formal break with neoconservatism, or more precisely, I guess it would date to the essay that was the beginning of the writing of this book a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that one might have expected uh, your divergence from what is now called neoconservatism to begin earlier with your book, The End of History. And mm -hmm. by that, I, I mean the following. I mean, that came kind of around the end of the Cold War, uh, first the essay, then the book again. Um, and it was a time when the neocons themselves, uh, I mean, all neocons were kind of trying to figure out, well, what is our foreign policy now? Because it had been based uh, around a kind of very intense anti-communism. And if the communist menace is no longer there, what are we about? Um, to the extent that there was an answer in the end of history, it seemed to me that part of the answer was, well, it may be that we never again have a threat of the magnitude of communism. In other words, we, there will be problems. We will need a foreign policy. But to some extent, the answer is you can relax just a little. Um, mm -hmm. Now, now, what, what the, the neocons that we today think of as neocons decided was something different. You know, Bob Kagan, Bill Crystal decided that actually there were a lot of things to worry a lot about, uh, mm -hmm. maybe China, rogue states with missiles. Um, and I think at a policy level, you continued to agree with them about a certain amount of that. You were for missile defense. Uh, as you note in the preface to uh, yeah, America well. at the Crossroads, you signed one of the uh, Project for a New America Century uh, letters warning about Iraq. This is in the late 1990s. Um, so uh, do, do you kind of get the... the question I'm asking, did, did, at some level, did the divergence begin much earlier? Yeah. And if so, why was it more evident to the rest of us? Uh, well, you know, there's two different divergences that I think were important. One was just the general level of 
uh, alarm. I mean, I think that for some neoconservatives, you know, in a sense, they wanted to have an enemy, and it was really uh, the end of the Cold War was a tough time because they didn't know uh, who the enemy ought to be. Uh, I think in the case of uh, Bill Crystal in the Weekly Standard, there was actually a deliberate search for an enemy uh, because I think that they felt that the Republican Party didn't do as well if foreign policy wasn't a big issue. And the late 1990s was the you know the period of the stock market bubble in Monica Lewinsky, and they didn't really have an issue in in all of that that I thought they, that they thought was particularly important or, or had much traction with voters and, and, and with the public. Uh, and I think they initially picked on China uh, as their uh, target. Uh, and I always thought that right from the beginning that that was a big mistake because, first of all, foreign policy shouldn't be driven by the needs of the Republican Party in domestic politics. And secondly, I just don't think that China, uh, it's, it's particularly useful to think of China as, a, as an enemy you know, comparable to the former Soviet Union. Um, and so in that sense, September 11th was a big godsend because you know, we were attacked and it, it, you didn't have to invent uh, uh, an enemy at that point, but I think that that, that just that general tendency to uh, think of the world as extremely dangerous and, 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 and full of big threats uh, is something that, that you know they tried to uh, carry forward. The other uh, issue really had to do this is I think the more interesting thing that has come up in a number of the reviews uh, about whether I changed my mind on the question of how easy, in a sense, and how quick the democratization of the world would be. Uh, because a lot of people uh, had uh, said that that was what the end of history was all about, that we were imminently on the verge of the whole world becoming democratic, including uh, the Muslim world, and now I'm taking that back, um, and that that had actually been part of the neoconservative ideology. And, and uh, uh, I was, in fact, uh, Todd Lindbergh at Policy Review had this little piece where he said it was like I was... I was Lucy teeing up the football, and the Bush administration was like Charlie Brown, and they were about to kick it down the field, and at the last minute I pulled the football away by saying, no, no, actually democracy is really hard, and it's you know, a matter of institutions and time and so forth. And you know, that's um, actually more, you know, looking back at what I've said about this kind of question, uh, I think that it may have been that when I wrote the original article back in 1989, I did have the sense that the transition would be, um, you know, fairly quick. But I think everything that I've done and, and read and thought about in the 17 years since then you know, has made me think that there is this long-term process that will get us there eventually, but that it is a really, uh, you know, long-term one. Now, you wrote this book, Non-Zero, where you, in a sense, carry that story way back, you know, before human history to, you know, single-celled, uh, you know, <laughs> organisms and well, so forth. Well, at least to the Stone Age, anyway. Yeah, well, so right. So you're looking at a billion-year perspective. And, I mean, I guess my perspective isn't quite that long, but I do think that, you know, there are reasons for thinking that there is this evolutionary process uh, that, uh, you know, has all sorts of economic and, and um, political ramifications and leads to more complex and more orderly societies. But... Uh, but certainly I think that is, it's a tough road, and in the specific policy judgment about whether uh, the Middle East was on the verge of a big uh, democratic tsunami, I don't think I've really ever believed that. Uh, you know, I've, I, I think that I've always thought that that would be fairly difficult, and if that's what defined a neoconservative as having that kind of optimism, you know, I think that was really a misreading of, of what I had been saying in the end of history. Yeah, and I actually think there's kind of a connection between the two parts of your answer, uh, between this, the, the, the first part about China being a, a threat that was kind of, uh, if not fabricated, maybe exaggerated uh, for expediency, um, and, 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 and this part about democratization and when it is and isn't easy. As you note in this book, um, your view all along had been that economic development plays an important role in paving the way for democratization. Yeah. And it seems to me that's, that's, that's not only inadequately appreciated in, in the way the neocons look at their various democratization projects right now in the Middle East and so on, but it gets to the, the China issue very much. Um, if, if you believe that economic liberalization ultimately tends to encourage political liberalization, mm -hmm. then you would not be inclined to see China as quite the menace uh, that they see it as, and you would not feel quite so compelled yeah. 
to play hardball in order to induce democratization as soon as possible. And in fact, on this view, if economic and, and, and political liberalization are connected in this way, you may actually be impeding democratization mm -hmm. if, if one of the sticks you use to beat China <clears throat> with is you know, withdrawing economic engagement. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that this is one of the kind of ironies of, in a way it's always been an irony of conservatism, because during the Cold War you kind of would have thought maybe conservatives would have had more faith in the ultimate triumph of, of, of market ideology. But, right. but in any event, in this context it seems to me ironic that neocons don't have more faith in the power of markets in the case of China and more respect for maybe well, the, com the complex relationship between economics and politics in, in, in other parts of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. I, one thing I said in the book was that if you go back over a lot of uh, you know, neoconservative writings on economics and economic development and that whole range of issues, uh, they almost never have anything interesting to say. The Weekly Standard you know, really never made this a, a particular issue, or to the extent they did, they just got some you know, orthodox market-oriented economists to write about, you know, about these sorts of things. But I don't think they ever thought about these issues uh, very deeply or had a particularly uh, you know, unique um, neoconservative take on the, on the whole question of, of how economics interacts. And if you look at the stuff that Bill crystal has been writing, it's, it's, it's completely Leninist. It, you know, he says, well, basically there's no longer-term pattern in history. Anything can happen. It's just a matter of political will. You know, you have to, you know, you have to lead by, by shaping events. And um, it's just a kind of extraordinary um, uh, retreat into a kind of political voluntarism that uh, completely ignores, uh, you know, the... Um, you know the complex social, you know, organization of societies and, and, and how that, you know, has to proceed or has its own logic. So, uh, I think you're, you know, you're really right about that. Um, okay. Now, you're, uh, the, the worldview you're putting forth is you're you're tentatively calling realistic Wilsonianism. Mm -hmm. um, now, the uh, and I know you're open to other titles, and we encourage viewers to. I will forward if they email us uh, <laughs> alternatives. I will forward right. them to you. Um, and and this is, I gather, to be distinguished from the main existing uh, foreign policy school. Certainly, it's easy to distinguish it from neoconservatism because, for mm -hmm. one thing, you do uh, have uh, much more respect for the, the difficulty of bringing democracy to a, a nation whose cultural legacy may not predispose it to immediate democratization. For example, right. that's one difference. You differ from the so-called uh, realists in that... Um, a, you do think the internal behavior of other nations matters and should be mm -hmm. part of America's concern. We're not just mm -hmm. confining our expectations to their external behavior. Right. Uh, B, you, you think international institutions and international law are important, and realists mm -hmm. tend to minimize those. I would right. say the, the contrast is less obvious uh, between the worldview you're putting forth and so-called liberal internationalism, and mm -hmm. maybe rather than try to define liberal internationalism, I'll either leave that to you or say that probably the Clinton administration's foreign policy is a reasonable proxy for liberal internationalism. I guess, I guess you'd agree to that. I don't know. but uh, it, Well, you know, there's a couple of different versions of liberal internationalism. I and mean, there's a, uh, um, <laughs> I don't know whether you want to distinguish between hard and soft liberal internationalism, but the hard version, you know, really does want uh, some form of world government and puts much more stock in the United Nations and, you know, says that you can't really have a legitimate uh, form of global governance unless it's truly universal and, and, and you know, all these uh, lesser kinds of organizations that are re organized by region or by function uh, can never have the legitimacy of something like the United Nations. And that version, I think, is just wrong. I, I just don't see that you're ever going to get there and I don't really see how you can create a single organization. I mean, either this large organization is going to be so powerful and, and effective that it'll actually be tyrannical, or else it's going to be what I think the United Nations, what's the reality of the United Nations now, which is that it will be much more consensual and voluntary, but also very weak. And I don't really see uh, a way of squaring that circle, but I do see uh, an alternative, which is to work you know, with, uh, um, in the framework of a lot of different types of uh, organizations uh, that uh, and, and some of which don't exist now, but that can give us, uh, you know, some opportunity for for 
uh, collective action, you know, across states and some degree of accountability. Uh, now, that you know that may correspond with what uh, you know what some of the Clinton people thought uh, they were doing in their foreign policy. Uh, but you know, I'm not <laughs> just because they did it. You know, that was a problem with the Bush administration. They they kind of define their foreign policy as anything except what the Clinton people did, and yeah. I think that's that's not the right way to formulate things. And, yeah, well, well, what? So, so then maybe my question is, what would distinguish your realistic Wilsonianism from a soft liberal internationalism, or is it, is um, it pretty close to that? Well, I think there's a missing element, uh, which was, I think, the Clinton problem, which is that I, I still think power is important. I mean, uh, the one um, part of my future agenda that you didn't talk about is the Bismarckian part, uh, which is to say power still is important and hard power is important, uh, there are a lot of problems that cannot be solved, uh, you know, without, uh, in the end, at least the threat of military intervention. I mean, the real case of that in the Clinton years was the Balkans, and I think that they were actually excessively reluctant to um, bring force to bear. I mean, they had to be kind of dragged to that kicking and screaming. I think the Bush people had the opposite problem. They were way too eager to use military power uh, in the first instance, but you couldn't have solved either Bosnia or Kosovo without... Um, military intervention. Now my particular take on that is when you try to use hard power in the context of being King Kong on the world stage, you have to be really careful about that because if it is too much in your face you're just going to generate a tremendous amount of uh, uh, backlash, uh, either just outright anti-Americanism or what people call soft balancing. There's no hard balancing. That is to say, you know, France and Germany are not going to construct a military coalition to oppose us militarily like you would have in the 19th century, but you know, there's all sorts of soft balancing in which they're either not going to help you or they're actually going to collude to you know, get in the way of things you want to do. This is happening right now, for example, in Central Asia. The Russians and the Chinese have created this little organization, including all the Central Asian states, and the purpose of the organization is to squeeze the United States out of Central Asia. So given this this structural problem that a lot of the world is going to resist American power, what you have to do is be a little bit subtle. Uh, it's not to abjure the use of power, and it's not simply to act through legal uh, norms and, and, and you know, formal uh, international organizations, but I think to be a little bit indirect in the way that you use power. And this is my Bismarck uh, uh, precedent, that you know, Bismarck used hard power to defeat Austria and France uh, and unify Germany. And then he was a status quo power. He had created the largest and most powerful country in Europe. It was a country that was a threat to everybody. It was a threat to the balance of power, and I think he understood that. And therefore, he spent the rest of his career basically trying to do things that would minimize the impact of, um, of the rise of German power so that you wouldn't get hostile coalitions uh, forming uh, against him, and I think actually, you know, the Chinese are doing something like that right now in in Asia. They understand that their very rapid rise uh, is potentially a threat to a lot of people, and they've done a lot to try to reassure, let's say, the ASEAN states you know, in Southeast Asia that 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 rise isn't going to threaten them by giving them preferential trade access to Chinese markets and this sort of. Thing. I mean, the only country that they've screwed up in this regard is Japan. I mean, they've really alienated Japan, but by and large, they've been pretty Bismarckian in their approach, you know, to, to reassuring people that they that nobody else had to worry about their power. And I think we've done just the opposite. I mean we've you know, we've said, well we're the hegemonic power and we beat our chests and said, you know, yes, and if you don't like it, you know, we're <laughs> that's yeah. tough because we're just gonna go ahead and do what whatever the hell we want anyhow. Yeah, and for my money the problem actually predates Bush. I mean I think Madeleine Albright when she stands up and says we're the indispensable nation and so on, I'm not sure right. she's doing us any good and I, I think um, part of the problem is Americans have trouble putting themselves in the shoes of the relatively less powerful mm -hmm. and, 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 and imagining what it's like to be less powerful and how you evaluate the hegemon. And I think it's partly because America has been powerful for so long. It may also be because the kinds of people who reach positions of influence in, a, in any country, tend not to be the, the tend to be kids who were like popular in high school and were doing fine mm -hmm. and weren't weren't looking up at the power structure with any kind of resentment. But for whatever reason, uh, you're right. China is better than we are at putting themselves in the shoes uh, of other people and and understanding how they're perceived. 
Well, that's true. I mean, weak countries uh, don't have any, uh, they don't have the option of standing on principle and saying, well, you know, if the rest of the world doesn't like what we're doing, well, screw them, we're just going to go ahead and do it anyhow. Uh, and, you know, in, even countries that are very similar to us in, in uh, ideology and, and culture like Australia, you know, they're, they've only got 20 million people, and so they kind of understand that they have to uh, give way on a lot of issues and they can't simply set the agenda everywhere they want. And we don't, you know, we, we've really never had to adjust uh, in, in that sense. And there are a lot of cases, you know, uh, you're, you're right about the Clinton administration. I mean, this, this problem has existed way before Bush, so that, um, you know, when Larry Summers would get up and say, you know, this American market-oriented model with privatization and, and deregulation is really, you know, the best, I mean, he generated a lot of uh, uh, pushback because even our close European allies thought that what we were trying to do is dismantle their social welfare state and, and try to impose a, you know, our American, uh, you know, much more libertarian model on them, and, and they didn't like this. Yeah. Um, they, they had no chance of imposing their model on us, and, and they thought that we, you know, we shouldn't do it to them. Yeah, and you know, on your point about how you're trying to combine a, a, a kind of a, a realist use of power with a respect for international institutions, you know, ironically, Bush had a chance to do that in spectacular fashion. It was his plausible threat to use force that got the U.N. inspectors into Iraq. Yeah. If he had settled for that, and, and I might say, I might admit that a, that a liberal, uh, you know, uh, internationalist administration that would be more to my liking might well not have gotten things to that point where, where you mm -hmm. where you get the UN, where you you lend that much power to the UN. But mm -hmm. Bu if Bush had stopped there and taken yes for an answer, you know, we've got the inspectors in there; they can go wherever yeah. they want, and insisted that they stay longer. That would have uh, that would have done a lot for the legitimacy of of the UN, or that aspect of the UN, I mean, I know mm -hmm. you, you have doubts about the long-term capacity of the UN to, to acquire yeah. and hold on to legitimacy, but uh, he, was, he was close. He almost, you know, uh, uh, he almost did something amazing there, but you're, you're right. I mean, he didn't know when to stop, and he was just too bent on the use of power in the end. No, that's right. There are a lot of cases of that, actually, where if a, if a great power actually... Uh, works with the United Nations, you actually get better results. So in Bosnia, uh, what broke out of the stalemate and made possible the Dayton Accord was some combination of the U.S. trained Croatian Army and the U.S. Air Force. And in Kosovo, it was, you know, again, uh, NATO. Uh, and even in these African cases, like Sierra Leone, that was, I mean, people don't pay attention to this, but there was a U.N. peacekeeping mission, and just as in uh, Srebrenica, they got taken hostage uh, by, by some of the local warlords, and it actually took the British deploying a battalion of paratroopers to get them out of that. Uh, and they were operating outside of the UN framework, but they're actually using hard power in, or in order to bolster uh, the role of the uh, United Nations peacekeeping mission. So I think that, you know, I mean, so I think the liberal internationalists, you know, are, are just. Uh, they, they don't understand that there are times when the, the power is necessary, or if you want to defend human rights, you know, sometimes uh, you, you can't be just even-handed in, in the way you apportion blame, but you've really got to figure out who's the source of the problem and then uh, go after that. Yeah. The, um, uh, no, it's, it's you know, no, you rarely get the, the administration with the right combination of, um, of instincts. Um, the, l let, me, let me move to some kind of... Uh, uh, applications of realistic Wilsonian, just by way of asking you what you would do about some some issues we, we face at the moment, or uh, how, if at all, the the principles of realistic Wilsonian would guide you. Yeah. Wilsonianism would guide you. Um, one is uh, is is Iran. In your book, uh, in America at the Crossroads, you you make the valuable point that bombing Iran would. Uh, have a good chance of delaying uh, the the onset of a more benign administration in Iran because it would it would tend to uh, shore up nationalist support for the current administration, which is uh, not an administration in any of its favor. Um, but beyond having a, a kind of healthy respect for the downside of bombing, what is what's your current position on Iran? I mean, uh, in terms of a whether Letting them have nukes is something that's thinkable, and and uh, B, at, you know, 
uh, at what price you would you would prevent them from that or how you would do it or what? Well, I think that uh, there's three options for preventing them from getting nukes. One is military intervention. The second is some form of sanctions in the United Nations that persuades them to stop. And the third is uh, somehow promoting democratic regime change that, that uh, uh, produces a different regime, but not by military intervention. I don't think any of the three of them are going to work. Uh, I don't think that we've got any good military options that will not make the regime ultimately stronger. Uh, I don't think the sanctions, I don't think we're going to get sanctions. I don't think you can get the Russians and the Chinese to buy on to them. Uh, and I don't think you're going to, although there's a lot of discontent against the regime, I don't think you can manufacture a democratic revolution under uh, present circumstances. And so I think that the, you know, then the question is, um, uh, can you live with an Iranian bomb? And I would say uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not a comfortable thing at all, you know, when you've got a, a president of the country saying that he wants to wipe Israel off the map and, and using rhetoric of that sort. However, if you look back at Iranian history, first of all, it's not clear that the president of the country is all that powerful. When Khatami was president, everybody was expecting that he would liberalize the place, and he wasn't able to do that. You know, the real power in, in that country is the Guardian Council and the Supreme Leader, and they're the ones that pull the strings behind the scenes. Yeah, this is um, one problem with the Hitler comparisons that a lot of people are trying to push yeah. right now. The, the, the yeah. Hitler had considerably more power within Germany than this guy has within Iran. But anyway, yeah, no, go ahead. I, I met, right, Ahmadinejad, I mean, I, I think is, is more of a figurehead than anything else. And then if you ask the question, well, how has Iran behaved in the past, um, you know, there's another alternative explanation, which is not that they are a, a, uh, a an anti-status quo, radical, revolutionary regime that's just chafing at the bit to overturn the order in the Middle East, but rather that they've actually been pretty cautious in, in their use of power, that they use terrorism and, and rhetoric, anti-Israel rhetoric, to uh, get leverage over other people but and other countries, but that uh, they actually are pretty risk averse and have not uh, undertaken, uh, you know, things like invading their neighbors the way Saddam Hussein did. I mean, Saddam Hussein is a good example of a real a guy that could not calculate risk well and, and took, uh, you know, really large ones and got into a lot of trouble. But the Iranians, by and large, uh, haven't done that. And so it does seem to me at least possible that uh, they, you know, will be like a lot of other countries. If they get a nuclear weapon, uh, they will not just hand it over to a terrorist. They're not going to, you know. One of the things that I think we learned after the bomb came into existence was that it's hard to use nuclear weapons for what um, IR theorists call uh, compellence. You can use it to deter people from doing things to you, but it's really hard to threaten people with a nuclear weapon to get them to do something positive just because the, the threat of actually carrying through is so implausible. Uh, and so it could be that, you know, it'll be a little bit like the Soviet Union or China during the Cold War. And remember, you know, with China they had nuclear weapons and we thought they were completely lunatic and out to lunch. And, you know, somehow we managed to uh, survive that period uh, because in the end the Chinese found that uh, their nuclear weapons were not things that they could use terribly well. Uh, so, you know, I don't like the idea of them having nuclear weapons, but it could be that uh, we will, you know, be forced to live with that, and it could be that living with that will, you know, will actually not be as bad as people fear. Not not as bad as the alternatives. I mean, th there is the, the new kind of threat, which didn't really exist in the Cold War, of uh, a state like Iran delivering a nuke via terrorists, and in that way not having its yeah. fingerprints on it, at least it would hope, and so uh, not being subject to retaliation. Um, you know, I think you can actually uh, deter that sort of thing because I think that we know enough about, you know, the signatures of different nuclear programs, and we could probably trace back uh, a, a bomb of that sort. I, th I thought we could have done that with Saddam Hussein as well, and you could certainly tell them in advance that, uh, you know, we we're tracking you pretty well, and if we see your fingerprints on and anything certainly like a nuclear weapon going off in, in on American territory. You know, we're going to clobber you. I, I, I think that we can, uh, you know, that that's a pretty easy posture to uh, to adopt, and I think it would have a pretty powerful effect. 
Yeah. Can I um, can I run by you my pet crazy scheme for uh, solving the Iran problem? Sure. Uh, I haven't found any. Well, I guess I've gotten some sympathy for this, but anyway, it's not it's not short on imagination. Here here's the idea, and it is broadly consistent with your idea of a kind of uh, decentralized uh, kind of global governance where you have regional bodies and to solve regional problems and so on. But anyway. The idea began. I mean, I guess there, there, there are two premises. One is that if, if you want Ahmadinejad to back off, you're going to have to give him a carrot that he can proudly wave before his constituency. In other words, he can't lose face. He has to say, I really got something out of this. If you're going to get him to accept really intrusive inspections and shut the, shut the weapons part of the program down. Uh, B, the... Uh, you know, the, the Arab states in the vicinity, they don't want mm -hmm. him to have a nuke, okay? So you might well be able to get them. I mean, so far as we know, they're not developing nukes, so you might well be able to get them to sign on to uh, an agreement to, to endure intrusive inspections on a regular basis so long as they could be assured that, that Iran was, was uh, enduring the same fate and was not developing the weapons. Um, and, and that brings us to, to Israel to round out the Middle East. Um, and here, here's, the, here's the kind of crazy part, but uh, if you could get Israel to say, well, okay, I mean, everyone knows Israel has lots of nukes. And, and, and if you could get them to say, well, okay, it's true, we do. In the long run, we would hope that the day will come when we won't need them. We need them for now, but, but we hope that won't be the case. And as a sign, a sign of good faith, we will, under international oversight, decommission you know, whatever, 50 of, of, of 200 or uh, 100 of 200 nukes, and in the future let inspectors uh, confirm that we're not making new ones, but we'll, we'll maintain a considerable arsenal. Um, now, everybody has some, you know, I mean, th that, would, that would be very tempting for ah Ahmadinejad to, to seize that and say, look what I got out of our mortal enemy Israel. If he didn't accept it, it would certainly put more... Uh, support behind the United States in whatever it did decide to do, because the, the, the consensus, and I think in places like Europe, would be, well, look, how good a deal do you want? So, what, what I mean, where do you see problems with that? Uh, I think that it's going to be really, I mean, there's so many moving parts to that deal that I just think it's going to be awfully hard to put together, uh, you know, to get the direct talks with the Iranians, to get the Israelis to it, pony up to all of that, and then to get all these other potential proliferators to, to get on board. You've got a sequencing problem because the Israelis are not going to own up to having nuclear weapons and permitting inspections until they have some sense that the Iranians will really uh, do something serious, and I, I, it's going to be very hard to persuade them that uh, uh, you know that's uh, possible. So this, what the economists call the problem of credible commitment, I think is really going to kill that kind of a deal. The one, however, there's a more modest version of it that you know, it's probably worth trying, and for all I know, the Bush administration may be forced to do this, which is just to enter into direct bilateral U.S.-Iranian talks over normalizing relations, uh, because I think that, uh, you know, the Iranians actually want that to happen, and they may be willing to pay something for it, and, and uh, if we can swallow our pride, you know, it, it would be interesting to see what, you know, because there are already apparently uh, some talks just with regard to Iraq, uh, you know, that our ambassador in Baghdad has been, you know, un, uh, engaged in. And if you broaden that to cover the whole relationship, uh, you know, maybe maybe something like that will work. And as I said, if the sanctions route and lining up all the, you know, the rest of the international community against Iran doesn't work, uh, you know, I think even the Bush administration out of desperation may be driven to something like that. Okay, and just to clarify, on my crazy scheme, uh, this, mm -hmm. is, this is the first time I've heard this, this objection of the sheer logistical complexity of it. So you're, you're not saying it wouldn't be in the interest of any of the parties to do this. In other words, with Israel, if you compare the alternatives, if the alternatives are either A, Iran has a nuke, B, we have a war with Iran, probably what I outlined is preferable from, Iran, from Israel's point of view, however hard it is to swallow for various reasons. So you're not, it's not that I have failed to serve anyone's interest here, it's just that... The, the, well, the number of frequent flyer miles you have to rack up, kind of. Or. It's not just that. I think it, you'll have the same problem as with arms control deals during the Cold War, which is that the verification of this is going to be really difficult. And I think that even with an intrusive UN uh, return of a UN inspection scheme, it's going to be hard to persuade the Israelis that 
you know, the, to trust the UN and that they're really on top of what's going on in um, uh, in Iran, given their you know their record elsewhere. So I think it's it's not just that the in terms of the incentives. I think you know if if you could if you could make all these commitments credible, I think the incentives would probably line up. But getting to the credibility, I think, is going to be pretty hard. Okay, this leads to a larger question about the practicality of policing nuclear weapons. I mean, you, you, you do agree, I take it, that nukes, well, compared to biological weapons, are an easy problem, really, in terms of inspections, right? Um, mm -hmm. you, you, and you do, but, but how easy? I mean, you do think in principle, a sufficiently intrusive regime is, that's possible in principle, it's just, it's it's a, it's a question of getting nations to sign on it onto it because it's such a yeah. by traditional standards such an infringement on sovereignty the intrusiveness that would be required. Yeah, I think that the Iraqi case actually showed that um, UNSCOM, which was the UN inspection uh, team that was kicked out in in ninety eight, actually did a pretty good job. I mean, it turns out they overestimated how much stuff the the uh, Iraqis had, but you know, they actually did a pretty good job, and actually they did a much better job than American intelligence did just on its own in, in trying to figure out what was there. So being on the ground, there's really no substitute um, uh, for. Um, the problem, though, is, is also what happened to UNSCOM, is that, you know, you, they can be kicked out, and, and then the international community doesn't have any real uh, leverage to get them back in, uh, again, unless you, you know, threaten to invade them the way the Bush administration did uh, so I think, you know, both of those remain true, that they can do some good, but they're also really not uh, easy to keep uh, keep on the ground. Well, do you share my view that given the way technology is moving in the realm of biotechnology, maybe nanotechnology, mm -hmm. and, and that even in the realm of nuclear weapons, uh, the technology will become somewhat more accessible to people, though it won't, won't become the kind of, you know, basement endeavor that, 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 that some of these others might, that... that if the world's going to be secure, say, 30, 40, 50, 60 years out, whatever, we are going to have to have inspection regimes at some level that right now we don't really seriously contemplate? Uh, I think that that's also, yeah, I, I don't think that that's going to be workable. I, I remember um, looking at, uh, you know, just bio... Uh, you know, a, a regime that would create a inspections, a, a credible inspections regime on the, um, you know, biological warfare front, and that is just almost impossible because, uh, you know, the nice thing about nuclear weapons is that there's these economies of scale. You have to have a really big industrial project to produce them. Right. It's very visible. It takes a lot of money, a lot of national effort, and so it's relatively easy to observe. When you get into the world of biological warfare, you can have a very small plant, dual use that will produce uh, all sorts of very dangerous things, and I cannot imagine uh, an inspections regime that will be sufficient to monitor that. In fact, uh, I was told by a former UN weapons inspector that um, they had this project to look at potential recombinant DNA uh, projects that would be of, uh, you know, weapons... Uh, applicable to a weapon system, and they found this, uh, you know, there's some biotech company in the Bay Area that was trying to put a virus inside of a bacteria or vice versa as a delivery vehicle, and they were ap actually outsourcing uh, a certain amount of this development in recombinant DNA to a lab in Ukraine, <laughs> and it was one of these things where they were trying to actually deliver a, uh, you know, a, a drug that would be beneficial to people, but you could use that exact same delivery method to deliver something that was really very deadly. And there's absolutely no, you know, international control over that. And when I asked various people in that, you know, scientific community what, what it would mean to actually be able to monitor that, they said it's just impossible, or you couldn't monitor it in a way that wouldn't, you know, kill off, uh, you know, most of the, most of the uh, research and, 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 you know, the creativity that, that goes into that. So I think the Biological sciences are really much harder to monitor than the physical sciences. But, but by the same token, isn't an alternative to some sort of affecting policing mechanism uh, extremely scary? I mean, should, <laughs> shouldn't you be more depressed uh, than you sound? Yeah, maybe we should be more depressed. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, now that we've got that cleared up. Um, 
Let me ask you quickly about um, China as another test case for realistic Wilsonianism. Um, I mean, I gather you, 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 you there something rather like the Clinton policy, which is really not terribly different from the Bush policy. I mean, it's yeah. fundamentally a policy of engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, I gather, well where, well, where would you differ from either? No, I think actually uh, we've had a pretty consistent China policy ever since Nixon and Kissinger that every administration <clears throat> uh, out of power or campaigning for power, you know, says we're soft on China and we're not, uh, uh, you know, forcing them to observe human rights and so forth. And then when they get into office, they end up with the same kind of accommodative, uh, um, you know, policy that, that virtually every administration has employed. And I think uh, that's probably the, the right one. I mean, um, you know, Bob Zelik, the Deputy Secretary of State, had a really good speech back in September where he talked about, you know, China's rise, and he said, you know, okay, the, you say that your rise is going to be peaceful, we'll believe you, we'll take you at your word, but, you know, there are certain benchmarks for this, and, and we're going to watch them, and I think that's actually a pretty sensible way of, of proceeding with them. Yeah. Now, the, the, the real question is, everybody um, can say that, but people also want to hedge us, you know, the Chinese military is one of the fastest growing, given their growth rate, you, you, you can just project uh, the size of their military ahead 10, 15 years, and, and in that length of time, uh, it is going to be something pretty uh, significant. And so the question is, you know, do you want to hedge against the uh, eventual breakout of China as a, as a real superpower, military superpower? And if you try to hedge, are you going to not actually make this a self-fulfilling prophecy by you know, convincing them that, that you're just dead set against them no matter what they do. And that's, I think that's really the difficult, uh, you know, strategic question. Yeah, and on that, on that front, I mean, this is kind of a small point, but it seemed to me that, you know, we just had this, uh, this visit, uh, this, this Chinese uh, summit or whatever you want to call it, and that we made this big issue over whether they could call it a state visit. It seemed to me that that was a kind of needless needlessly offensive thing to throw at them? I, d I didn't see exactly what we were giving up. Am, am I being just a mush-minded liberal here, or what? Was there, was there a big value in playing hardball on what we call it, or...? Yeah, no, that seems uh, kind of silly to me. Good. Yeah. Uh, we agree. Well, then, let's <laughs> move on to an easier problem, which is uh, the uh, Israel and the Palestinians. In, in, in America, <laughs> the crossroads, you said, uh, you know, well, it'll be interesting to see kind of what what the Bush policy is after the Gaza withdrawal. I think the book probably went to press before something else interesting happened there, which is the uh, Hamas victory in the election. Yeah. Do you, I'm just curious, uh, do you agree with Tom Friedman that cutting off the funding has been a mistake? No, I think actually that um, it's a good thing that Hamas won in, in a certain way, because the old theory was that you'd have this, this corrupt uh, and incompetent organization, Fatah, that would create a state, it would clamp down uh, on all of these proliferating militias and security organizations and so forth, and then would be able to sign a peace agreement um, with uh, Israel, despite the fact that Hamas itself was nipping at its heels and challenging its legitimacy uh, and so forth. And so, uh, and, and you had this tremendous confusion, you know, whenever there's a suicide bombing, uh, do you attack, you know, Hamas that actually perpetrated it, or do you attack the Palestinian Authority that didn't prevent it from happening? Uh, and I think now it's actually better, uh, you know, they, they just appointed this, uh, this terrorist to be the security chief of Hamas, and so in a sense it clarifies things, and if they do anything inside Israel, you know who is responsible. Uh, you can't ever have this, you know, divided uh, 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 authority, uh, you know, again, and, and so in a way it makes the Israelis' job easier because they've, they've really got a clear return address right now. Uh, and I think in the long run it also sets up the stage for a long-term evolution in Hamas itself uh, because I do think that, you know, there's something about actually having to run a country that makes you much more realistic in terms of your goals. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not good that you've got a, an organization, you know, uh, devoted to wiping Israel off the map running the, the PA, but I think that also um, the old system was nothing to write home about either, and I think that uh, uh, at least this provides you a long-term path to 
actually creating a Palestinian state that actually could be an interlocutor at, at some future point. Yeah, I mean, this is very much what I was saying after the Hamas victory. I was saying I think it's a, it's a good thing. The problem with Arafat is he could always plausibly claim that he couldn't control the violence anyway. Well, why negotiate with somebody who can't control the violence? Um, but I, I, in retrospect, I've been backing off that position, not because I think it wasn't in principle right that that was a great opportunity, but because I think uh, I misgaged how badly the rest of the world would handle the opportunity. And by that, I mean the fact that, you know, we're cutting off uh, the funding. Uh, Israel is taking an extremely militant at attitude. They're even cutting off the, the tax revenues that, that arguably are the rightful property of the Palestinian people. And all of this gives Hamas an excuse, the excuse that Yasser Arafat had, which is yeah. to say, you know, because you're, you're seeing the place seemingly descend into chaos. And... Uh, and, in fact, you're seeing a number of attacks not originating from Hamas on Israel, and Israel is retaliating and so on, and in part because uh, Hamas has denied the resources you would need to actually assert control and run the place, I think now it's going to be possible for Hamas to say, look, we don't control the violence either, and if that's the case, then again, you've got somebody you cannot effectively uh, negotiate with. So, I mean, I shared your optimism when this first happened, but it seems to me, uh, and again, Tom Friedman's written a couple of columns saying this is a big mistake to cut off the funding to Hamas, and I think uh, that's been kind of a watershed. I'm, I'm just much, much less optimistic than I was. Are you not as discouraged as I am by that, by that policy? Uh, well, I think you're still in an early stage of this. Uh, I think that, um, you know, in principle, it's right that, uh, you know, the for Israel and the United States and, and you know the rest of the international community to say, look, you, you've got to you've got to agree to certain basic uh, you know principles like uh, um, the right of Israel to exist, you know, before we play ball with you. Uh, and I think it's a kind of tactical decision about how much funding you let in because you also don't want to look like you're uh, starving you know Palestinian children or, or undermining their ability to actually have a state. Uh, and so that's a, an adjustment that you know, I think can still be uh, probably can still be made. Okay. Um, and finally, let me just return to more abstract considerations again about you know what you what you mean by realistic Wilsonianism. You um, you emphasize that you do agree. Uh, I mean, in, in contrast to the realists, and but but like the neoconservatives to some extent, you do agree that the internal behavior of other right. nations matters. The internal mm -hmm. conditions of other nations matter. Um, I, I want to get clear on what it is about the internal conditions that matter. What the neocons have stressed is democratization, human rights, um, and you say in uh, America at the Crossroads, well, we should pursue those in their own right. Those are kind of moral goods or something. And my own view is that in the long run, 30, 40, 50 years out, the way I see the kind of threatening technologies evolving, probably a prerequisite for American security will be that democratization, democracy is very widespread and markets are very widespread and so on. But it seems to me that in the short run as well as in the long run, in terms of just American national security, the most important thing about the internal conditions of nations that matters, well, 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 two things. I mean, one is that there not be any obvious terror cells, but, but also uh, the state of, you know, weapons of mass destruction, that they not be making nukes, uh, that they not be making biological weapons. So in other words, I think I'd say transparency in the short term is more important to America's national security then is democratization per se. Is that, does that make sense to you? Um, well, I guess it depends on the kind of regime. I mean, you're not going to get uh, transparency in North Korea, you know, one way or the right, other. Right, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, to, to demand transparency would have to presuppose a kind of regime that you could work with to some extent uh, that is not, you know, a rogue state and, and, and not, uh, you know, following some kind of uh, out-to-lunch uh, ideological agenda. Um, 
And if you have that kind of rogue state, uh, then your options are much more limited. Uh, and, and I'm not sure, you know, just a demand for transparency is one that you're going to be able to get to unless you change the regime or unless it evolves into something that's more democratic and more, you know, amenable to outside pressure. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I guess I would say in the a kind of example would be Iraq right before we invaded. We'd actually, at least for the time being, achieved transparency. We had the mm -hmm. weapons inspectors in there. They were, go, you know, yeah. they were looking around. But, but the Bush administration didn't even think about settling for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that was a case where there was at least a short-term distinction. The other thing is that in principle, I mean, maybe not a rogue state, but certainly a, I mean, by definition, a rogue state probably won't give you transparency. Mm -hmm. But a non-democratic state certainly could submit, in principle, to very intrusive inspections of any nuclear facilities or, or whatever, or, or inspections that assure that there aren't any nuclear facilities. So you can at least imagine something that's not a democracy that gives you, or if China right now, well, I would say two things. China right now uh, could, could, give, could give us that. Uh, and B, China's an example where you see that the economic liberalization alone provides more transparency than there used to be. If we yeah. remember the Cold War, when we had no clear idea what was going on there. Um, and, and I guess, so I guess you can imagine ways where you have more or less transparency without having crossed the line to democracy. And the neocons seem to want democracy. And it seems to me that at least in the 10, 20, next 10, 20 years, a more important thing for our national security is transparency. Yeah, but but China is also not a problem with regard to proliferation. Uh, you know, they, they've had nuclear weapons for, for decades, and, and they could produce all sorts of nasty biological stuff and, and, and so forth, but we don't really worry about them because we don't worry about their intentions. And so the really hard cases where you'd need uh, something more than that are these rogue state uh, uh, countries that are really ideologically or just by quirky you know, national personalities not amenable to you know, the same kinds of inducements and incentives that a country like China is. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the real test, because those are the countries that are going to give you the problem. Uh, right. And so I, that's why I think that just, you know, transparency by itself without reference to the regime is, is not, uh, I, I, I somehow think that's not, uh, that's not going to be sufficient. Okay. Well, uh, like I said, it's a great book, and it's a, it's a short book, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, and uh, easier I, to write too. What's that? It's easier to write a short book too. Well, why is it that I have the opposite? Why, why is it that I have so much <laughs> trouble writing one? Then you're going to have to give me lessons. Um, is, is there anything about the book that either hasn't come out in this interview or hasn't come out generally that, or that people seem to misunderstand that you want to? Uh... No, I mean I think one of the uh, more forward-looking parts is that I've got a chapter on development. I, I run a international development course at my uh, program at my school right now and I think we've got a whole big agenda you know people like Jeffrey Sachs have have you know posed this challenge of development and I think that uh, you know in a sense um, you know there's a very specialized community that looks about looks at that and worries about it but in American foreign policy it's always been a kind of stepchild uh, and that the real men you know think about you know aircraft carriers and nuclear weapons and things like that uh, but I think that that's a big mistake because uh, if you're a realistic Wilsonianism and you think that the inside of states is important then you've got to figure out you know how to promote development uh, both uh, not just political in terms of democracy but also economic because ultimately that's what uh, you know it's, it's very helpful for political democratization as you said earlier uh, and that's really something that uh, you know I think we need a lot more a lot more wisdom on. Yeah, um, I agree. And also, I mean, as far as the real men and aircraft carriers, I mean, the use of force, and in some ways, ironically, just seems to me more problematic as a practical matter. Uh, I mean, something Don Rumsfeld didn't appreciate entirely, that there's, there, there, there are things about a modern technological environment that as much as they empower a military, also make the blowback, uh, also empower the blowback uh, in yeah. some ways. So I'm all for, uh, I'm all for, Soft, looking at soft power and economic development and everything else. Um, well, thanks again. Okay. I enjoyed it. And, uh, I mean, you turn these things out so fast that uh, even if we wait until your next book, which I hope we won't, we, we'll, we'll maybe be seeing you pretty soon. All right, good. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.